Hi guys. Uh, I only have like about 15 minutes and that's not enough time to really share all the things I want to say to you. So I do kind of talk really quickly. So I apologize for that. Um, I think it's, I'm talking about spaces. So it's really important for me to connect with this space, which is really humongous. It's, I remember when I was a kid, I used to kind of uh, gauge whether or not I was tall enough or whether or not I could retrieve a balloon attached to the ceiling. And today I can say I'm not tall enough. It's really impressive, especially looking around at all the... <laughs> all the different ways that this room could be reinterpreted. I'm also a game developer, and when you play a video game, you often set something in the environment so that the player knows where to go. If I was, wow, that's like a magical castle. If I was playing a game, I would say, fear not, princess, I'm on my way. And I would be heading up, <laughs> to, to up, way up there. And this is the sort of thing that I do on a daily basis. I get in front of a room of people. They could be uh, three, four, 60, 80. It really doesn't matter. And we try and reimagine how a space can be used. And what I find more and more is that it's really immaterial. These walls are really just an arbitrary division of space, which I will explain to you in more detail. I thought it was nice to reveal something about myself. We are up here, and so a certain level of candid communication will show some authenticity. So I would like to reveal a picture of what I hold inside me. I have some really squishy organs, a lot of them. I have blood, I have bile, I have lymph nodes. <laughs> There's all manner of osmosis that can happen at any moment of the day. I do diffuse across a semi-permeable membrane. <laughs> but in all honesty, science is amazing, and it's, it's an amazing approach to observe things. And science itself doesn't have to be relegated to any kind of you know, left or right brain. I believe science is the observation. It's being aware of where you are right here and right now. And things, when you look at them in, through a microscope or a telescope, start to look the same. We start to see it's just really a network a network system. This could be uh, perhaps a cell, or it could be a star system, or it could be a road map network. It really comes down to the idea of one system in which particles are passed around. And of course, with a circulatory system, it's very obvious, as long as things keep moving, we stay alive. I looked at space. And it's really ironic looking at the definition, I'm a bit of a word nerd, so looking at the etymology, where space came from. And actually at the root of it is Latin spatium, and it says it's the stretch of time. Einstein, my mind, so, it's, so, so space is actually time. Which got me thinking that maybe it's all just one space. It's just our lifetime. One space and we can divide it up and experience in different rooms, but what do we do with that space? And do we give each other, our children, our co-workers, the right to redefine what that space means to them? We are in space, but we are in space. And it's really overwhelming sometimes how huge that is and the wealth of information that is around. And how do we make it meaningful on the human scale. Because of course, we are so cerebral nowadays. We have all this big data and wealth of sharing information, and yet, at the end of the day, you want to be able to take off your shoes and feel the floor under your feet like a child. We used to lick the carpet and pull our hair and taste and touch and go, oh, that's what wood means. You don't have to have a Wikipedia page to tell me that. And so it's really important to re-engage with the spaces and make it meaningful again, make it important. And there's a really unusual thing that happens. I found two characteristics of our learning, and they kind of work against each other. One is we love to copy things. So as soon as you come up to something that resonates with you as true, you duplicate it in your own mind. So that's a copy. And then we tell everyone about it. We echo it. We share it on Facebook. We copy, copy, send, send, echo, echo. Unfortunately, there's a second part of learning whereby if something is reiterated or copied too much, we become numb to it. It becomes cliche. 
which means it's repeated so much it loses its original meaning. So in one way, we're finding all these truths, repeating them so much that then we become none to the truth we found in the first place. And so as an educator or an executive, we try and work out how to make it meaningful and how to overwork the cliche, especially you're working against this. These are facts and figures. Did you know every minute we add 48 hours of YouTube footage? So if you're trying to catch up every minute, you're another two days behind. We have lost that battle, my friends. And so big data is just barraging us. There's over 2 million Google searches, over 200 million particles shared by email every single day. And how do we recontextualize all this in a classroom or a workspace? Well, I say we give it back to the people who we are trying to empower, the students, the coworkers, the employees. And why not allow them to reshuffle the chairs? Imagine each year was allowed to redefine where the teacher stood, how they stood, how they communicated, maybe have the tables in a circle. These are simple things we can change around our daily lives. In example, if you could all just quickly check with me under your chairs. Now, a good chance it just feels like underneath of a chair because I haven't put anything there. But the important thing is you start to re-engage, yeah? You probably didn't inspect. You came along with a red chair, sit down. I know what's under there. But your fingers are searching and you start to re-engage. And that's such an important process. So I have a friend who actually works as a knowledge worker and they have one big space and all the walls are movable. So, so one day, you'd go out one door and you'd lead to the toilet, and the next day it might lead you down a hallway, which is a bit disorientating, but imagine you're never on the same rote, habitual circuit. You're always being re-engaged. Looking at school, when I was at school, I thought I was in a waiting room, waiting for life to begin. It is fictitious. L life, I think, is always a continually ongoing. And I think education should be seen as a phase, not a place. You're not going to school, you are in a phase of learning. And the way I propose we do that is by having avatars of learning. So that means whatever you do, any experience you gain in life adds to that. We're not having a predetermined number of classes or awards or lectures or medals, these things which say that you've reached a certain level and now you can go out into life. Instead, you are learning. Anything you do adds to this online avatar, and you can graduate or go out into life and engage from, from the moment you wake to the moment you sleep, and that's native to us. We always want to learn. From young child, we want to learn how to talk, how to walk, how to sing. And so the idea that we edge away from learning because it's school is abhorrent. Now, I know there are people who try to edge away from technology because they say it isolates people. You might hear, for example, Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Phil, and I'm trying to recontextualize. You have the man and the woman, which is an age-old dialogue. And then you try to introduce an androgynous android into the conversation. Now, this technology is confusing things because you got the man who's thinking that the woman is saying what he wants her to think she knows. But now, when he's saying what she thinks she's saying, he's in fact not feeling that moment because he's not the woman. <laughs> but in all honesty, it can be really simple. <laughs> it can be really simple. We can have this at play. Just as native as a child running through a sprinkler, that is the engagement with technology, with a system that we should be able to play through. We have a kind of cool uh, website. If you happen to have Instagram on your phone right now, you can uh, fire up Instagram on your mobile device. And what this is, is it's a map. It's a real-time map being generated. If you take a photo on Instagram now, or at any time, and hashtag it as this is now, it'll come here and paint a picture of what's happening all around the world. And this is such a beautiful wealth of information. We start to see our place it is a fleeting moment, and soon it's gone and lost in the collage, but it's something that you can be a part of. And it's through uh, websites like Storify, there's another one. You can start searching and pulling together as an aggregate all the different experiences we are having and find your place in the macrocosm. 
I really like the public space. I think the public space is vitally important. I classify the public space as being a workplace or a public square or an education facility, whatever it is, it's an intermediate space. You have the home, very insulated, one-on-one, -on -one, you eat your food, you hug your loved ones, it's a very direct experience. Then we have on the other end this idea of the great beyond. How can we fathom our place in the global system? Yet in the middle, we have the public space. We have a space where we can start to see beyond ourselves, start to see different cultures, hear different sounds, and it's just a glimpse. And so what I really encourage is public displays of community. So this is an example of I went out and danced with strangers. And people start to respond. You're not there to ask them for money, they're just there to have some fun, and they have time for it. We have time. We are so rushed, busy, but we have time to interact and connect. I decided to push this onto a national level. Myself and two friends got rid of our money for the moment, only had the clothes on our back and a camera. And we went around Australia to reclaim our surroundings, to say that we had a right to be there and we had a right to experience and we did not need to prepare. A key line we thought is start where you are, use what you have and do what you can. It's simple, there's no run up, there's no waiting room, this is happening now. How do you live your life? May it be the signature of your soul. This is called From Nothing, it's online and we made a web series out of it and we really hope to do it again. You can just step out into the world, interact and that is life and living. Then you can bring it back through technology. I create interactive environments. So we go out and have all these experiences but it's not a self-centered enterprise. I give this back and other people can experience it. I have some amazing friends. This is a picture of my friend Mark Bolleton and he has this lymphatic, lymphatic choir. He plays keys and they sing the notes he's playing, these faces. So someone has some and now he's reimagining or re-experiencing that other person's experience. Another friend of mine, Toby Kay, he created a, a, a helmet which enables you to see behind you. So you can still walk around, but you're seeing sort of 180 degrees of where you usually see. A really interesting way to re-envision your surroundings. Another really, really close friend of mine, Matt Cornell, and he's a movement advocate. He thinks it's so important to keep moving. Like I said with the circulation system, my uh, solution for writer's block or creative block is to start to move because aesthetics themselves are a wavelength. If you're sitting there as a solid block trying to access these almighty thoughts and inspiration, if you better embody it, if you can better embody the art itself, you flow like the song you're trying to sing, like the great idea you're trying to uh, envision, you're already on the wavelength, you just communicate it out. So a simple thing like getting up, shaking around, being silly, I really think is quite powerful and important. We are at play, but this is vitally important in the reimagining of what we do for a living. I love that idea. This is what I do for a living. Make sure that you live for a living, yeah? We have these ideas of economy. We have a commodity-based economy, a goods-based economy, a service-based economy, which is what we're just coming out of. And all of these relate to something you can possess, put a flag in, lock away in a safe. But now we're starting to become the wiser. We're starting to look at the experience based economy. People are more and more willing to invest their time and the money and the resources to having an experience which they can't hold on to but was part of their story. And beyond that, we're moving into the transformation based economy. It's not even about the experience, but it's about the change that comes due to that experience. And talking about education or even the workplace, they're prime examples. It's how we are changed beyond that. Circulation is so important. Keep moving. In summary, I'd like to have a look at the fact that we have an economy which is purely the way we move around our resources to fulfill the basic needs of mankind which haven't changed for tens if not hundreds of thousands of years. We need a meal in our belly, a place to sleep and a feeling of belonging. Now that can be satiated and furnished in many different ways. That is the economy. Society itself is purely structured in a way to facilitate that economy. We have a building here, a road here, a workplace here, simply so those particles can be flowed around, which of course is defined by what we circulate through the system that we choose to have as the economy. It's an amazing algebra. It's purely A plus B equals X. If we start to put too much importance into the dollar that we're floating around, we forget that it's just an item. As long as there's flow, it's important, and it can be transformation. If your currency was the fact that you brought about change and improvement, 
I say that should be something you can trade as a valuable final product. You bought an improvement and you should be able to trade that for something else. Beyond that, we have the education system, which prepares us for the society. And so how we learn in that can be determined by what society needs. And it's a transformation that comes about. So we have the full cycle. If we define a new economy of transformation and change, our society can change and be architecturally designed to suit that, and our schooling and education system, in turn, can be changed to better service that economy, to better service our basic needs of food, shelter, and belonging. Dance more. Be filled with wonder. Make something wonderful. Life is far too important to be taken seriously. Do not stagnate. Just be here. And sometimes we struggle to find a word for that. The willingness to take a moment out of our busyness and acknowledge each other's existence. Let's be silly. Let's be the best kind of willy-nilly. Let's, let's just pin our attention to trees and pour it over the feet of passing strangers. Let's cast it over a thousand books that we could never hope to read or finish. And well, we may not, but imagine all the things we could start. This, this is silly, and this is light, and this is the nothing of rich men. This is the wealth of a casual gaze. This is a sigh of appreciation. This is those pinned shoulders beginning to rise, unburdened from the guilt of the daily grind. Instead, the cart of the merchant can be tipped free of its wares and packed with raucous strangers, all aligned with one intention, to just go fast and go high. This is unapologetic fun and work. I mean, we can test and experiment and play until our imaginations are spent. This is a twinkling eye pulling a thinkly mind out of its thunk and casting into a moment we find moping on the brim of our brows. The thin now we squeeze between the furrows of worry. This is a wealth never named because it's too hard to sell. It may not clear our debts and not just yet feed the world's hungry. It may not save us from hell, but it will give us a moment to pull our head from the sands of time long enough to breathe free and perceive what it is we are so caught up in that we don't have the time for the feelings of others. Which grand hand authored this numbness? I say it's time we question and reinspect the architecture and the draftsmen. As we run through this darkness, let's remind ourselves that humankind is bound together. We are tied at the ankles. So let's learn to tango rather than stamping on each other's toes in anger. We are here now, but for a moment together. So let's be present, be unhesitatingly generous and self-empty. Be candid and blatantly thankful. I thank you. 